Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. First of all, uh, I would like to thank, uh, you know, the organi organizing committee for the 58th Indian Orthopedic Association, and par in particular, Dr. Sanjay Chitaveri for inviting us to be here today. I think the, the idea of this course, and I also would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, my colleagues and uh, from the local uh, faculty, Professor Ashok Jawari and Ramani Nara Shimam. And, uh, you know, from uh, Europe, we're bringing Manoj Ramakandram, uh, myself, and unfortunately, Bjarne Malamalsen was supposed to be here too, but he had some visa problems and could not make it, so we'll go and cover his uh, topics. What this course is about, you know, we got an invitation from EFORT and I'm currently the president of the EFORT and it stands for European Federation of Orthopedics and Traumatology. So we invited to have uh, this course and to come here and uh, I thought it was a good idea to involve also the European Pediatric Orthopedic Society, EPOS, and IACON to have uh, the possibility of uh, putting all together and what we decided to have, like an interactive course, a little bit different, try to be relaxed, and that's why we come dress up in a relaxed way, so you also can be relaxed and enjoy yourself. This should be a discussion over the different cases, and uh, we're going to have asking some questions, so we need your participation, because we also want to learn from your own experience, and this is what uh, is the idea. It's a little bit different from what you are used to, so you're not coming here to give lectures, but mostly to discuss the case and try to learn from the experience on your daily basis. So we will focus uh, in the morning on the orthopedics cases and in the afternoon we'll go over the trauma cases after lunch. So once again, I would like to, to thank all these three organizations to put it all this together and I hope that you will enjoy the course as much as we did planning it. So we're going to start with the first case, and I ask Manoj to come along and bring out the first clinical case. Um, it's an honor to be here um, teaching on this course with distinguished faculty and thank you all for coming this morning so early. We're doing this slightly differently um, in that we're going to present some cases and maybe get a show of hands as to what you would do in, in the certain questions on management or treatment and then we'll go through the evidence for or the current evidence for whether you should do it one way or the other. Um, I'll talk a little bit about where I work in one of my later talks but we'll just go straight into it. Um, and start with a case of a three-year-old boy who presents with left hip pain and stiffness. So he's, he's walking around with a limp, he's got a stiff uh, left hip, doesn't move very much, and he's in quite a lot of pain. He's only three years old and he's a boy. So just from a show of hands here, just out of interest, we tend to use the herring classification. Do you all know the herring classification? Anyone? Do, do, do we know whether this is a herring a B, a B, C, or a C? If we don't know, we can go through the herring classification. Okay. Does anyone think it's a herring B? Herring B, C? Or herring C? Okay, no show of hands. So I'll assume two things. One, everyone's tired. And two, <laughs> you may not know the herring classification, but that doesn't matter. So we tend to use the herring classification to work out. So if we look at this, what we think the prognosis of this left hip is going to be. So Perthes disease, avascular necrosis, this is Perthes disease, leg calve Perthes disease, avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis of the femoral head, more common in boys than girls, tends to present between the ages of four and eight. Um, and there are lots of factors that we look at to work out whether this hip is going to have a good prognosis or a bad prognosis. Some of those are clinical factors, some of those are radiological factors and we tend to combine the two. And we'll look at the evidence behind how we work out whether we should do something for this boy or not. So we tend to use a classification system uh, called the Herring, but there are lots of classification systems. 
the first sort of most well-known one is one called the Catterall system, and Tony Catterall in London. It's a very confusing system and hasn't got much intra and intra inter-observer reliability. There are lots of other classification systems, including Benjamin Joseph here from India. But the one we use most commonly is the herring classification or the lateral pillar classification, which in most studies is shown to have the least intra and inter-observer reliable um, errors. So the lateral pillar is actually the lateral 15 to 30 percent of the femoral head. So it's not, it's not dividing it into thirds. It's the lateral 15 to 30 percent. It's the bit of the head that takes the weight under the acetabular dome, the sore seal. So if that starts to collapse, you basically aren't weight bearing very well and the hip starts to make its way out, it subluxes out, and it starts to become less congruent. So we call herring A where there's no real involvement, so 100%, the head is full. Herring B, where the height is over 50%, and herring C, where the height is less than 50%. And then there's this classification called the BC border, which we'll talk about in a second, where it's between a B and a C. And this classification is the best inter-observer reliability. It tells you how well they're going to do it in the future, but you have to do it at the end of the stage known as fragmentation. So they go through an ischemic phase where the head dies, then the head fragments on an X-ray, and then it reossifies. And it's during that, at the end of the fragmentation stage that you apply the herring classification. And generally, herring A's do very well, herring C's do very badly, and the herring B's are somewhere in the middle. So the BC border was introduced in 2003, and, and we'll look at an example in a minute. But it's where the lateral pillar is really radiolucent, so you can see through it, or it's very narrow, so um, it's not a wide lateral pillar, or you can't tell whether it's a B or a C, you call that a BC border. So the problem with introducing that, it adds another um, classification part, which makes it more prone to inter and inter observer error. So something like an A is like this. The lateral pillar is very big compared to the normal side, and they tend to go on to have very nice hips. A B is 50% loss of the lateral pillar, and they can end up with quite good hips too, depending on uh, what happens to them. A BC border is this, where you've got a very narrow lateral pillar. It's quite loosened, and it's somewhere around 50% loss compared to the lateral pillar on this side. And a C is something like this, where it's collapsed more than 50%. How useful is it? Well, the biggest study in the North American literature is from Herring's group. This is from Texas Scottish Rite Hospital in, in da Dallas, Texas. And so he Tony Herring's group published on uh, more than 400 patients. And we'll look at the paper that they finally published. But this is their part one, which is they were assessing how reliable their classification is. And they found that the intra and inter-observer reliability is over 90%, and it was excellent. So it's a good one to use to predict how bad that hip is going to be. In terms of outcome, the second part of the paper, which is in the American JBJS, in over 400 hips, they showed that the, the, the two things that mattered most as to how the hips did in the long term were the age at onset. So the younger you are, the better you do. And the lateral pillar classification. So the more loss you have of the lateral pillar, the less good that you do in the long term. And this was for all types of treatments. Remember, per phase disease, people have tried everything from nothing to bracing to um, osteotomies of the femur, various osteotomies to contain the hip, osteotomies of the pelvis, various types to contain the hip. So this is a mixed group. But the only thing that was related to outcome was age of onset and the lateral pillar. And they generally showed that if you were over eight years old when you get per phase, and you're a boy, you tend to do a lot worse because boys have less time to remodel their hip. Sorry, if you're a girl, girls have less time to remodel their hip because they finish growing about 14, boys finish growing when they're about 16. So if you're an older girl and you get perthes, you tend to do a lot worse than if you are a very young boy. Um, this paper from Korea looked at whether the, the lateral pillar classification was good for their group. But interestingly, they added a C1 and C2 group. So even out of the 50, the less than 50%, the bad groups, they said even those you can divide into half and half, how much they've collapsed. And the ones that have not collapsed as much, so between 25 and 50%, tend to do better than the ones that collapsed more than, more than 25%, more than 
but the best way to look at all the literature is to do a, a systematic review of every paper. Perthes disease was first described in 1910, so 2010 was the 100th anniversary of Perthes disease. And this paper looks at all the papers that have been published about Perthes disease in the last 100 years. And they're to look at what we can use to predict whether the hip is going to be good or not. And the things they came out with, again, was if you present after eight or nine years of old, you tend to do badly. If you're a girl, you tend to do badly. And the, a few other things they found in the literature was if you're a very, very heavy child, so you're putting a lot of weight through your hip, you tend to do badly. If you lose a lot of hip movement while you're going through this process of perthes, you tend to do badly. If you get contractures of the hip, particularly an adduction contracture, you do badly. And the longer you, it takes for you to go through the perthes, to go through all the stages, the worse you tend to have in term, uh, worse you tend to be in terms of outcome. So those are all the clinical factors, you know, when you present, whether you're a boy or a girl, how much movement you have in your hip, and then there's some radiological factors. We need to take an x-ray. And I won't ask for a vote, but uh, because the answers are up here, basically. These are all the factors that determine how badly your hip is going to do. So the more of your hip is involved, the more of the femoral head. So a total head involvement means you've got a poor prognosis. If the hip starts to subluxate out, so it starts to move out, you have a poor prognosis, and the more of your lateral pillars involved, we've seen already, you have a poor prognosis. The biggest study in the European literature, so we looked at the North American one from Tony Herring's group, the biggest is if some Sweden from Terje Teyersen, and, uh, sorry, it's Finland, um, and they looked at a bunch of patients, of so 425 patients, and followed them up for several years, most of them were treated with just physiotherapy, no operative treatment. So this is the natural history of Perthes disease if you do nothing. And they showed five years down the line that the things that de determined how well you did were whether you were six years or more, so not eight, they found if you're older than six when you first present, you do worse. If your whole head is involved, you tend to do worse. If your lateral pillar is collapsed more than 50%, you do worse. And if your femoral head cover is less than 80%, so it's starting to sublux out, you do worse. And that's in, a, in a over 400 patients, so that's a very good study. So with someone like our boy who's three years old, you've got to decide whether you're going to do something or you're not going to do something. And the options are physiotherapy plus pain relief and rest when it's active and leave him alone. Bracing to hold the hip in a containment position to keep the femoral head inside the acetabulum, or surgery to hold the hip. Just as a show of hands, just to get an idea, for a three-year-old boy presenting with that kind of hip, what would people do? Would people do physio and pain relief, A? Okay, would people do bracing, one person, and would anyone do surgery? And the others would do probably nothing? Or you've got a four, has anyone got any other options in a three-year-old? No? Okay, so we're looking at mainly physio pain relief. If you look at the evidence, Herring's group said theirs was a mixed bag. Their 400-odd patients was a mixed bag of everything from bracing to physio to osteotomies. The main thing they found, there was no difference in outcome among the hips with no treatment, those treated with bracing, and those treated with range of motion therapy. Nothing. It made no difference in the long term. This was repeated uh, by another group from Texas Scottish Rite. So this is Dan Sicato, who is another uh, person where Tony Herring was involved in it. They then did a prospective series. So that first paper was just the retrospective review of all the patients they've treated before. They then started to look prospectively at patients who went through range of motion exercises or bracing, so non-operative therapy. And there were 56 hips. And they, were look, they looked at them 20 years down the line. So this was a prospective cohort that was followed up. And what they showed was very similar again, that if you're, just, if you're not treated, if you have no treatment at all, you tend to do well as long as you're not one of the poor risk categories, that you're not the older girl, for example. But even then, there are lots of people who have hips that are not very round by the time they're fully formed, so when they're skeletally mature, that tend to have problems in adolescence and as a young adult. And the more round your head is, and the more round your astablum is, so that's called spherical congruity, the better off you are. If you're aspherically congruous, so your head is flat and big, 
in an ACE tablet that doesn't fit it, you don't mm -hmm. tend to do as well. And if you're aspherically incongruent, which is the worst type, where you've got a hip that's round, but the sockets, sorry, the hip that's flat, the femoral head, and the sockets round, you wear your hips away. So that proves again that the natural history isn't, isn't good for certain types. And the problem with Perth is, and we don't know the answer to this, how do you pick those types out early? And then the next question is, if you find them later, what do you do about it? Do you need to do something to make them into a better hip? And I'll talk about that in the next case. Um, in this sort of age group, very few people do surgery at, in a three-year-old. You're very unlikely to do con containment osteotomy to the pelvis and femur. But there is a very big minorly operated group from St. Louis, Missouri, treated by Perry Schoenecker. And we're talking about 213 patients. So that's a lot of patients who went through a specific protocol, whatever stillbirth, whatever herring classification they were. They went through a period of uh, having an adductor tenotomy. So you cut the adductor tendon, you put them into a plaster, a broomstick plaster. So it looks like this. And then you convert them into a, a brace. It's called an A-frame brace. It looks like an A. And they wear this all the way through. I mean, they can move their hips around, but they wear this all the way through their healing phase of Perthes. And they showed that no matter what classification you were, A, B, or C, pretty much most of the hips ended up with really good outcomes. So they even took Cs that presented late, put them through this, this containment protocol of adductor tenotomy and bracing, and managed to keep them at uh, spherically congruent or aspherically congruent. So they didn't collapse and become the worst type, which is interesting. And, and, this is a, and that's their protocol in St. Louis, and not many people do this, but there is, that's very good evidence from their group. In Europe, we've done a sort of consensus study on what people would do with Perthes disease. Um, and the general consensus, so this is a group of experts all saying, what would I do if I was given a patient? And they were given four scenarios. They were given two patients who were younger and two that were older than six, and from both age groups, one with a good range of motion and a good x-ray, and one with a bad range of motion and a bad x-ray. And generally, most people would do very little other than physiotherapy and pain relief. Very few people would do containment strategies like splinting or osteotomies. There are some one or two odd people who, who, who'll do something really drastic like an arthrodiatasis where you put an external fixator on the hip and distract the hip. But not many people do that. But generally, people tend to intervene more if they're an older child and if they are girls that present late, for example. So someone like this kid who, this three-year-old with a left hip, who came about 18 months ago to our practice, you see them at six months later and it looks worse, but it's going through its sort of fragmentation. Six months later, it starts to reossify a little bit. And six months later, so this is about two years down the line, it's starting to form a decent family. This is what doing nothing. And the range of motion is back. And you can expect this hip to go on to have a spherically congruent hip, which is contained. Uh, I'll stop there. Yeah. With a sure. Because I think one of the major problems here is uh, the clinical aspects. We have been talking a lot about the classification prognosis. How much do you value the, if the hip is rigid? Because if you have a very rigid hip, and yeah. you cannot control it, you can expect that the femoral head is not to become as spherical as it's supposed to. So I, I tend to correlate the, di the prognosis also with the clinical. Uh, Completely. But what, what I've always found it difficult is to correlate whether that stiffness is due to uh, the femoral head becoming out of round or whether it's muscle spasm around the hip. So in those hips, I tend to do an, an EUA arthrogram to see what's happening, just to look at the range of motion while they're asleep. So if everything relaxes when they're asleep and you've got good motion, you don't worry about that hip. But if it's tight and it's not moving, then you might be more worried. I know that you've sometimes you've used Botox as a way of relaxing um, the adductor muscles and the spasm. That's one strategy. The problem with all this stuff is it's, there's no real evidence behind, behind it. So what we need is two groups. One, we do nothing, and one, we do something for those stiff hips. But all these, all these series are cohorts with no control, and that's a big problem. A hundred years down the line, we still don't know the answer. Are there any other questions?
about Perthes disease, yeah. So. So what for no one knows. So you're, ma you're maintaining range of motion. Um, the most important thing is to try and get abduction and to prevent contractures, adductor contractures and flexion contractures. So it's, range it's range of motion therapy. You can use hydrotherapy. People have, there's no standardized protocol. It's range of motion therapy. And it's, it's limited a bit by how much pain you're in. So you have to have pain relief. Sorry? The end point is when they have range of motion and they stop having pain. So that's why it can go on forever. There's no protocol. And the question is whether this would have got better anyway if you hadn't done anything. It's a bit like metatop. Yeah, so you know, some people would advocate that they avoid impact and contact sports, so trampolining, jumping up and down a lot. The problem is most of these kids are constitutionally mad. You know, they want to jump around and destroy their hips. It's very, and you, other than tying them down, you're not going to say to them, don't do anything. And we have no, you know, what you say to parents to do and what they actually do, we don't know. So they, they can come back and say, yeah, I'm, I didn't make sure he did no sports for six months. You know, we kept him in bed rest. I mean, you don't know. And the, the kid's going to do whatever the kid uh, wants to do as long as they're not in pain. So it depends on which regimen you're following. So I don't, following, I don't tend to use a brace at all. We've completely, bracing has gone out of fashion in, well, definitely in England, but in quite a lot of Europe. But if you do it, so in that protocol, which uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, which Perry Schonecker uses, it's till they get through the, to the healing stage on x-rays. So all the way through the fragmentation stage, and then it starts to reossify and starts to remodel, and that's when you take the brace off. Me, I'm not, I don't use bracing at all. So, so for, for that study, the average time was between 14 to 15 months. So, yeah. So we'll come back. I think one of my colleagues is going to be presenting about the older child and containment strategies. Uh, it's, I think it's Dr. Roman he's going to present later. So I'm going to leave that because he'll show the evidence, but we can talk about it after that. And that's a completely different scenario. Because if they're an older kid, over eight, they haven't got much remodeling left, and then you're left with a hip that's at risk of having a very bad result. But again, the evidence there is, you know, protein. Sorry. Yeah. Weight bearing. They walk around like this. So they can weight bear. It's quite difficult to go very far but you can w walk on it. But most of the time, this, they work on just range of motion, flexion. This is a one type of abduction brace. There's lots of them. There's a, this is Scott. Internal slightly, yeah. But this A-frame, it hasn't got that much internal rotation. The, the classic one is the Atlanta or the Scottish right brace. That's got slightly more internal rotation. Yeah. It's a big thing to put. It's like Ponsetti and the wearing the bracing on your feet for four years. It's a big thing to go through, but their results it's difficult to, to argue against, except there isn't a control group. That's the problem. So you need half the people in, those, in this study should have not had this treatment. I'd be interested to see where they end up 10 years down the line, and we don't know that. Know. Yeah. The interesting part is that when I started practicing, we used to do a lot of bracing like this. But the major problem here, you see that it was very symmetric. If you have an uh, abduction contracture, then you ended up by having a, a pelvis tilt. So actually, if you don't solve that problem, yeah. I don't think this brace will work it out. And that's the reason why you gave it up on using a brace, yeah. because you ended up with a lot of things like this. And st stiffness as well yeah, as the other thing. Exactly. So I think you, you really have to be looking at the clinical aspect of the hip. So if you really have a good um, abduction, then you can use the, this brace as a kind of containment. Yeah. I think that everybody started to use it. But uh, as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, nowadays, who is going to wear a brace for 14 months? So, you know, people will wear, put their little babies through Ponsetti because the children aren't doing very much. They'll wear the brace 23 out of 24 hours a day because they're six, you know, they're not walking yet. And they'll wear them at night time because they're small kids. But by the time you get to four or five, they won't wear a Ponsetti brace, let alone this sort of brace. 
That's the problem. It's finding, having said that, if you can absolutely prove that this is the right strategy, then that's what we should do. But we can't absolutely prove it. It's one strategy. So, any other questions? Were you about to say something? Yeah. As far as the brace is concerned, I think you have to wear it till you see ossification hmm. of the lateral column. Because otherwise the column collapses. It can take up to two years or more than two years. Two. Yeah. Not there have been follow-ups about 15 years back on Atlanta bracing and other types of bracing in big papers which had come out here. But none of them could prove it. So is there any load of mass appeal? But how long? How long would it be? And, and what's non-weight bearing? Because if you lie in bed and you flex your hip up, you're putting about five-sixths of your body weight through your hip. That's the problem. The muscle forces are still acting. So non-weight bearing has no role. I think for their benefit, I would just like you to define that subset where you offer surgery. So which are the cases where you would offer surgery? Yeah. I mean, I thought that's what the next case was, okay. was about. But, but your colleague isn't here yet. But we can talk about it, and he can talk. One yeah. last question. Yeah, sure. What are your exceptions for a three-year-old or below six, I would say, that you'll consider an operation? Yeah, so uh, this is exactly the, what we talked about is that clinically they get very, very stiff, and they're in a lot of pain and they're walking around with this incredible limp, and you can't, you're, then they're developing contractures, and you're looking at this hip thinking, this is a hip that they're not gonna use, have any function with. So you're trying to restore some function. It may not necessarily improve their long-term prognosis, but you're improving their function in the short to medium term. So those, I'll do an EUA arthrogram and see what the range of motion is. May do an adductor tenotomy if it's really, really tight. I've, been, I've, I've seen children being treated with Botox, but I haven't got experience myself. We haven't used it. We aren't licensed to use it in non-neuromuscular situations in the UK, uh, other than cosmetic reasons. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then in terms of actual surgery, I'm, I'm, I know there are people who are proponents of various containment osteotomies. My philosophy and our philosophy in our, in our group is to stay away from the femur as much as you can because the problems in the femur, we often tend to have to, inter so the primary problem is in the femur. Secondly, then you create a secondary problem, which is a deformity, which often needs correction later. So you often end up having to take a plate out and possibly doing a valgus later to correct the shape of the proximal femur. And thirdly, our hip replacement colleagues don't tend to thank us very much for creating problems around the proximal femur. So we tend to stay away from the femur. So if we're gonna do anything that's to do with containment, we tend to work on the pelvis. And our philosophies move from reorientation type osteotomies like the Salter to a labral support procedure like the shelf. So it's a shelf to basically create stability and a bigger acetabulum and to contain the head and allow it to remodel. So and we don't leave any metal work behind, so it's just a pure bony shelf. So it's as much stealth surgery as you can to leave the femur alone. That's our philosophy. I'd like to know what you guys do for, what, 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 what's your feeling? We tend to, at a young age, we tend to do a virus. A virus, that's to me, yeah. I think the problem really comes at late, uh, late age. Right? Yeah. Because you really can't give too much virus to the femur. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, the older kid would end up having to do a femoral, but yeah. I think, you know, related to the varus osteotomy is something that I felt is the work from Benjamin Joseph. Yeah. When it comes yeah. to two series or 300 uh, cases, more than 300 cases, uh, either containment or varus osteotomy. But what I think it was very appealing to me was to go over the face of the process. So, we ended up moving to the healing phase right away by the stimulation of the osteotomy. Although, as you mentioned, and you mentioned too, you can end it up with a, if you do a too much varus osteotomy, you're going to end up with a deformity. Mm. And maybe later on you 
Balkans lost the Ottoman to Rwanda. So I, I think it, you know there are several approaches, but as you mentioned, no really case comparison. No, nothing. Groups. That's the problem. So, so you, it's very hard to, to decide what to do. Shall we? If we can move on to an older case, which is so I think what one of the colleagues will talk about. Um, We'll talk about what to do with that older child um, where you're thinking about a containment osteotomy, so the sort of seven, eight, nine-year-old group. We're going to talk about a bit older than that, so a post perthase. So this is, a, you know, this is a kid you've seen uh, for the first time, and they've had perthase disease in the past. And in fact, this is bilateral perthase. And they come to you with this um, problem, saying that their right hip hurts and the hip isn't moving very much. So it's very stiff, there's hardly any abduction. They're walking with a limp and they've got a trendelin positive gait. And you know, we do see a lot of these people, particularly if you haven't been following them up yourself, they've come from elsewhere. Uh, we see a bunch of these older adolescent kids with perthes, post perthes. So just, to, I mean, these are, there are lots of options in this age group. One of them could be leaving them alone and waiting for your adult surgeon to do a total hip replacement. One of them is to move the trochanter because as they abduct their hip, the trochanter impinges against the lateral ilium. So you've hardly got any abduction at all. You can get more abduction by sort of rot externally rotating your hip and then moving it out, uh, but it's still limited. Or you can do something to make the neck longer, the femoral neck longer. So there are lots of different types of neck lengthening osteotomies combined with trochanteric advancement done through various approaches. And we'll talk about what those are in a bit. But have any of you seen patients like this? I'm sure you have. Would, how many people think that this sort of case, uh, if you just move the trochanter, they would do well? Not many people. How many think they might do well if they have a neck lengthening osteotomy? Okay, and how many of you would just wait and just wait for later total hip replacement? Okay, so I think we're heading towards B, but we'll talk a little bit about the older adolescent perthes. So when they come later with deformity, the important thing to realize is even if they're older, they may still have some remodeling. And in that case, they're too old. You know, they've already um, finished their growth. But some of them come with still some growth left. And you can even calculate how much remodeling they have um, using their growth remaining, which is it's an Oxford-based, um, so it's derived from a study in Oxford, of how you decide how much growth a child has got left. And if they've got more than 30% growth left, then they might remodel their femoral head and even their trochanter and not be left with much problem. So that's important to realize, but we're talking about the older kid who's pretty much grown. And you have to examine them very well because you have to work out what their problem is. They might, you can look at an x-ray and say, I think the problem is that the trochanter is sticking up too high. But there are lots of reasons why they present with pain in this age group. Um, and the reasons can be extra-articular or intra-articular. But extra-articularly, the trochanter can impinge. And intra-articularly, it can be the shape of the femoral head. It can be chondral lesions. It can be a labral tear that can be giving them pain. So you have to do an impingement test. You flex them up to 90 and internally rotate them. If that hurts in the groin, it's likely to be a labral tear. And there are lots of contractures they can develop around the hip for various muscles. So there are lots of reasons why they get it. If you, in fact, I'll just show you this. The other two things that I'll talk about a bit in FAI, the, in the talk on slipped epiphysis, femoral acetabular impingement, they can get Retro, they have retroversion of the acetabulum, so in certain positions, the acetabular edge is pinching up against the femoral head neck, and that's a pincer lesion on the um, acetabular side. Or it can be the femoral head neck junction has got a cam lesion, so it's sticking out, and then that's impinging and causing a secondary labral tear and chondral lesion. So you have to really work out clinically and radiographically what the right thing to do is. Um, So you can do a trochanteric advancement, but all the studies with pure trochanteric advancements in a post-perthase 
population, they don't really improve their pain or limp. Your x-ray looks nicer, but just simply moving the trochanter is, is not enough because you're not correcting a lot of the other problems in the hip, mainly to do with how the femoral head neck shape is. So if you, just, if you think you can solve the problem with trochanteric advancement, it's, you're unlikely to. The problem is, on top of the bony things that we see on an x-ray, and this is the problem with Perthes, is a lot of the decisions we make are based on the x-rays we see, but a lot of the problems that a Perthes child has are to do with their soft tissues, mainly the cartilage which we guesstimate by looking at the x-rays, but it's the cartilage we're more worried about, about how it will remodel into a nice femoral head. And also, so the cartilaginous and larger, the, the hypophysis itself, but also the cartilage covering where they may have chondral lesions, and the cartilage around the edge of the joint, the labral area, which might have tears. And if you do MRI scans of older kids with heel perthes, there's a very high incidence of labral tears and chondral lesions related to how poorly formed your head is. So the more out of round you are, the more coxa magna, coxa breva you have, so short neck, big head, the more likely you are to have more acetabular and femoral head chondral lesions and labral tears. And, and this, I mean, the St. Louis group, which is Perry Schoenecker's group, they do a lot of work on this too. And they've, they've shown over and over again that chondral lesions and labral tears are common in patients who come with post perthes hips with symptoms. And they're more likely to have them if they're male, if they've got a high trochanter, and if their joint is incongruent, so they've got an out of round hip. So one of the options is a neck lengthening osteotomy, and there are several of them. Uh, and there are some complicated ones like the Wagner, but a simple one to do is a Morsha osteotomy. I don't know if any of you have done a neck lengthening osteotomy, but this was described in the German literature originally, and then the original group of patients that were operated on in Basel in Switzerland by Morsha were followed up. Well, 37 patients followed up for eight years. They had a neck lengthening osteotomy and showed that four out of five, ha so four of five of them had degenerative changes and ended up having four of them ended up having a hip replacement, but the others were still functioning an average of eight years down the line. So the kid that I just showed you, this is what we did. So you take the trochanter off and you advance it, but you also make the neck longer by doing a sort of sliding osteotomy obliquely below the lesser troch. And that means you end up with well, a said that doesn't look amazing um, but you have to go ahead and take the metal work out, and you can also refashion the head-neck junction at that time. And you can give them a pretty reasonable hip. In fact, now you look at the other hip and start wondering what to do with that. So that's one way of doing it. And in the last three years, we've, we've so this was done four years ago, the last three years we've started using a, a surgical dislocation approach, which is a controversial area. So there are some groups in the world who use surgical dislocation. The problem with surgical dislocation, particularly in Perthes, is you have to be very careful about where the vascular supply is. And it's not in the standard areas of the, of the capsule. So when you flip the trochanter and you get down to the capsule and you're making your capsule a cut, you have to be very aware of where that cut is before you dislocate the hip. And in Perthes, the epiphyseal arteries are coming in posterior superiorly in the femoral neck and you have to be aware of that so you don't cut through them when you go in and give them a second shot of Perthes, which is a stupid thing to do. Um, and you can, you can monitor them as you're doing this. So you can use intraoperative Doppler monitoring to see what you're doing in terms of the blood supply. So there the, are the few groups that do surgical dislocation on this group of patients. Uh, the biggest one by far is the group from Bern in Switzerland where Professor Reinhold Gans first described the safe surgical dislocation technique. And they've got a group of 53 patients, which is a massive group, post perthes who had joint preserving surgery dislocations, combined with acetabular osteotomies in some cases and an intertrochanteric osteotomy in one case. And they showed nothing, I mean, it's not incredibly impressive. They showed that their pain and hip function improved by four or five points, which is not huge. Um, the tonus grades of osteoarthritis improved slightly. But, but importantly, no, no one really got worse, as in they didn't collapse the hip any further. They reshaped the hip and the five-year survival was 86%, which is pretty good. 
This is what you do in a safe surgical dislocation. You dislocate the hip, you then refashion the femoral head neck junction. You make sure that the hip is stable when you put it back in. If the hip is unstable after you've done that, then you need to add something on the periastabilis side. So you need to do a periastabilis osteotomy. So this is big surgery. And then you fix the trochanter back on with screws and relocate it. Again, all case series with not much follow-up. You know, we haven't even got, we've got two, three year follow-up for most of these people. We haven't really got to 10 years. Um, and there are only certain groups doing them. So Basel in Switzerland, uh, sorry, Bern in Switzerland, um, Boston Children's, um, Draw Paley, who now works out of Florida. There's a few groups doing them in volume, and there's others like us who do a few as they come along. And we're following them up very closely to see what, what it looks like. And then, the, so then the Shoneckers group in St. Louis, Missouri. So they, for them, they tend to do the same thing, but they add a PAO, a periastable osteotomy, if the lateral center edge angle, the anterior center edge angle, so these are all indicators of acetabular dysplasia, if that's high. Um, these are the factors they use to add, on top of this, a PAO. So, I mean, and it's big surgery, and the question really is, are you preventing or delaying a total hip replacement? There's no question in the short term and medium term, you're giving them more motion, you're getting an x-ray that looks good, and you can see that they've got more range of motion, they're functioning well, but if you didn't do anything, yes, they have to put up with a poor hip currently. You could just do a neck lengthening osteotomy and give them that movement. But are you delaying a total hip replacement? And that we don't know the answer to, because when you look at the, the only series from Bern that they've followed people up for more than about six or seven years, 10 to 12% of them ended up having a total hip replacement. And for all sorts of reasons, from the hip subluxing out, because you took, you, you ended up with a femoral head and acetabulum that just doesn't fit each other and becomes unstable, uh, to sudden progression of osteoarthritis. From something that was quite stable, it suddenly rapidly degenerates. So it's something to think about. I mean, certainly you can improve their function in the short to medium term. The question is how much intervention are you going to put them through to give them a hip that looks great on an x-ray, but you have to convince yourself that you're giving them a hip that lasts them a long time. The one other thing I'll just throw in, and this is just controversial, that you may or may not have heard about. There are some people, and, and I'm, by some people I mean three, and that's Professor Gans from Switzerland, Michael Leunig, who also is from Switzerland but works in Zurich now, it's his, it's his son-in-law, and Troy Paley, who works in Florida, who've done uh, intracapital osteotomy. So you take a big femoral head, and you take the central part of it out that's not functioning, and you reduce it. And you take this piece off here laterally with its retinacular, so this is with surgical dislocation, you take this piece off with its retinacular vessels attached to it. This bit medially is, is more stable, has blood supply coming in. You take the central portion out, and then you arrange the head so it's as round as possible and then you fix it back together with screws and you often have to graft that little bit there because you have to move the head. They only, so they've written up 12 cases, there's only one publication and it was published in an obscure journal that took me a long time to find called the Bulletin of the NYU Hospital for Joint Diseases journal. So it's from one journal, they have 12 cases, this is the case that they show. So this is a hip that they say was very stiff was hinging out, and this is their picture of it hinging out. It doesn't show that much hinging, but anyway, this is this, this is hinging out. And so they went in and did a subcapital, so an intracapital head reduction osteotomy. They then realized that postoperatively, the hip was subluxing because Shenton's line here is broken. So they went back in and did a periastabular osteotomy. And then they said, now the function's great. Uh, the follow-up is roughly around four or five years now. It's, it's very, very big surgery, and that's for a completely misshapen femoral head to see if you can make it into a better-looking femoral head. So again, the x-rays may look great at the end, but have we altered the natural history? Don't know. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Any questions? Or oh, any thoughts?
One of the things that always worries me is that when you do this uh, length of the thermal length, although sometimes it's a relative length, because if you just do uh, the lateral displacement of the greater trochanter, you are also lengthening relatively the neck, the, the, neck. the, the superior neck. Yeah. One of my questions, and you show that, and it ended up with a subluxation. Yeah. So actually, my question is that uh, when you do this, I'm always afraid when I do something like that because I'm increasing the forces around the hip. And as you mentioned, we know that uh, in the natural history, these hips they tend to do more or less okay until the age of 40. Yeah. So what are we really gaining, except for a very nice X-ray, and maybe the people are not having a trendline book anymore? Are we causing or aggravating the development of an osteoarthritis? Possibly, particularly if they've had secondary remodeling of their acetabulum to, the, to that shape that they've made, and then you've then lengthened the neck and potentially changed the forces around that hip. So the worry is that you may have to consider doing a, a PAO at the same time, and then that's a really, really big surgery. You often don't have any information about what the cartilage is like inside because you haven't opened the hip. So there are some people who arthroscope these hips first to work out whether the head, the cartilage is whatever grade osteoarthritis, whether it's worth doing a reconstructive procedure. There are others who use degemeric MRI scanning, so delayed gadolinium enhanced MRI cartilage scanning to work out whether the grade of the cartilage is so poor that there's no point even starting down the pathway of reconstructions. These are all strategies we use, but the problem is we still don't know whether we're altering the natural history significantly other than short term. And I, I agree with you. I think you, you, you may be creating more trouble. Theoretically, if you lengthen the neck and laterally displace the trochanter, you improve abductor function and the hip should center better, theoretically. But these abductors haven't really been working for very long. And they have to slowly relax out because they've been contracted for a while. So I, I'm, you know, these are all things we have no answers to. I, I don't know what your feeling is. That's the problem. That's the problem. So if they're, if they're completely, if you just see it on an x-ray, then you're treating the x-ray. But when they come with problems, then you have to do something. I haven't seen some of these patients coming up to your clinic because they start to lift. They never had any pain. Yeah. And then you say, well, did you have pain when you were six, seven, or eight? No. Was working properly, and then you see that you have a very high riding greater trochanter, and they start to have a very severe trend length, what makes them very unhappy. So you really have to do something. But there are other causes too. So sometimes they don't look that bad in the hip, they haven't got a high riding trochanter, the head is a little bit big, and they're limping or they've got impingement type signs, and then you get an MR and you see that they've got an osteochondral lesion. You know, there are other causes. So there are some that I end up scoping and treating just that because anything else is, is overkill. You're just treating their labral tear or their problem and then maybe refashioning their neck a little bit arthroscopically. But this is a different, I think when they've got a trochanter like this, you have to, and their symptoms are pointed to that, that's a bit more, you have to do something more aggressive. But it has to be a, a, a la carte approach. I don't in any way fool myself into thinking that I'm changing their natural history, but you're improving their short-term symptoms. You have a good experience in terms of doing arthroscopy on the hip now. And one of my questions is how much uh, can you rely on MRI when you compare to the, what you see on arthroscopy when you do an arthroscopy? How, how much can you rely on the MRI? It's because I yeah. think it's uh, nowadays, I think it's mandatory on these adolescents to do an MRI to check what kind of problems you have just besides the, the bony. Yeah, so the question for me is whether you can just go straight to an arthroscopy and use that as your diagnostic tool without having an MRI. But there are parts of the hip that are difficult to access, and you wouldn't act, try and access arthroscopically unless there was a problem there. So you might miss pathology. So for example, the, the inferior posterior compartment. So I, I try and avoid using a posterior lateral portal because it's too close to the sciatic nerve, unless I have to. If there is something down there, then I do. So if I use that as a diagnostic <coughs> tool, I'd miss that compartment completely. Um, there, are, there are lots of good studies showing correlation between MR arthrograms and intraoperative arthroscopy findings, and they correlate very well. They correlate best if you have an arthrogram at the time of the MRI, so with contrast in rather than a plain arthrogram. 
So a plain, so a plain MRI picks up the vast majority of sort of chondral lesions, but misses about 10 percent, and it picks up 90 percent of labral tears and misses about 10 percent. So you're losing about 10 percent of information without an arthrogram. So we tend to our radiologists tend to give an arthrogram before they go in to the MRI scan, and then you get all the information you need. And it's very unusual to find something unexpectedly in there. The usual problem is that the scan that they've had done versus when you operate on them, there's a delay. And so there might be progression of pathology by the time you get there. So. I, I don't know, if you have people to, as to do an MRI to evaluate the hips, it's not such an easy procedure. Do you have people here that can give you this kind of information? Yeah, they, we don't do degenerate scans, but they can tell us about the actual cartilage. Yeah. I show that in one of the VDH patients. Okay. Thickness of the article. The problem, I mean, so it's a very useful tool. there are only three radiologists in London who are happy sticking needles into a under 16 year old, and that's that's the problem. Yeah. But I think it's worth it to train people. So. But I'll show some MR arthrograms in the slipped epiphysis to an arthroscopy. I do. Let me find it. Hang on. It's an error. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to find. But your X-ray show is it very well. If you can go over it. Yeah, I, I, see the original Moshe one doesn't show it, and that's the problem. Moshe. So this is Moshe's paper. Yeah, amazingly, they don't. They show why the abductive forces are better. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, there you go. So, there's the trochanteric osteotomy, which you're then moving <coughs> distally. There's the oblique osteotomy around the lesser troch, which you're then sliding to increase the neck. So here, you've by moving this distally, you're increasing the neck length superiorly. Here, you're increasing the neck length distally and then you fix it with a blade plate. Do you do it this, this way? Not do you take that quite. slice? No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't do take the slice. The, the, the problem with this cut is the vessels are running yeah. just here. So you've got to be very, so you, you use a saw blade to about there, and then the last bit you tend to do with a little osteoterm, and even sometimes a chisel, to, and then you crack it and take it you don't want to just take a saw all the way through because you'll kill the femoral head. But it's not, I mean, that's the best picture, and that's his original article. Okay. Let's carry on. I don't know what we're doing next. Oh, yeah, I can do my skiffy talk, but I'm just going to plug in my... Um, Obesity is increasing rapidly in India, in the, amongst particularly the middle classes. <laughs> yeah.
So we'll talk about slip to Um I, I thought I'd put this X-ray up because this is a very cool X-ray. Does anyone know what this is? Sorry? Yeah. Anything else you notice? It's in a cat, right? This isn't a human. So the only other species that get slipped epiphysis other than humans, naturally, so you can, div you can create an animal model in dogs and sheep and goats and pigs, but the only ones that get it naturally are Persian cats. And they're male Persian cats. They tend to be overweight. And in adolescence, they have a very high incidence of slipping their epiphysis. And many of them are bilateral. This one isn't. But I use this with some of my colleagues and trainees to see if they can work out that's not human. Because it's not human, if you look at it carefully. <laughs> okay, so this is a 12-year-old girl who comes to see you or gets brought into your clinic with acute left hip pain and they can't wait there. Right? And she comes to you at 12 hours down the line with that hip. So how many people would, would take this hip Right, so look at that, the left hip, and fix it where it was. How many would, at 12 hours, take them to an operating theater, do a gentle reduction, open the capsule and just let some of the hematoma out, and then fix it? And how many people would take the theater and say, I need to get this correct, open it all up, reduce it and fix it? Okay. What if they came to you 10 days down the line. So it's now nearly two weeks since it happened. And she's been lying around in bed and the family decided to bring her in. How many would fix it in where it is when you see her? How many would do a close reduction, try and evacuate a hematoma and try and fix it? And how many would do an open reduction and fix it? So there is some feeling that if it's acute, particularly within 24 hours, you want to Try and it's like a fresh fracture, you want to reduce it. But there's a lot of hematoma, there's blood inside, and you want to release the pressure and fix it. While if it's a bit later, it's not as acute, and the dangers of trying to manipulate it are higher. By the way, this is not evidence-based, and I'll show that to you. It's, it's more a feeling. Because if we look at our practice in the UK, and, this, and we're going through this at the moment because we're trying to set up a randomized trial of all slips in the UK, that every slip in the UK gets put into one arm or the other, depending on what type of slip it is. Our feeling in the UK is if it presents within 24 to 48 hours, you would take them to theater and try and do gentle reduction and fix it. If they come any time after that, we tend to put them on rest, bed rest, no traction, just bed rest, and then wait for about 10 to 14 days for everything to calm down and then do an open reduction and fix it. So using a subcapital osteotomy, usually a fish or a done cuneiform osteotomy of the neck to get it back and fix it. So we have this concept that there's this middle window, somewhere between 24 hours and two weeks, where it's bad to do it. There is no evidence for this. There's evidence for going in early, and there's evidence for doing an open reduction. But there's no evidence for waiting. It's just that that's what we tend to do. So the, the classic paper, and the important thing is inability to wait bear when I said that girl was 12 years old. If someone walks into your clinic, then they've got a stable hip. It's slipped, but they're walking on it. It's stable. And Loder, in his classic paper, describes stability as being able to weight bear. And instability as not being able to weight bear, even with crutches. <coughs> so, he, so they might be lying down, and you say, can you get up and walk on it? And they say, no. They say, OK, have some crutches. And if they get up with crutches and somehow get around, that's still stable because there's some connection between the epiphysis and the neck, and that means they can put some weight on it. And that means some weight, even standing up with crutches, because that puts forces through your hip. Even moving your hip puts a lot of force through your hip because of the muscle contractions. If you can't move your hip at all, so you can't even get up, that means those two pieces are completely separate and it's completely unstable. So that's the definition of fazil stability. It's not, can they get up and walk around? It's, can they move at all? So in his paper, if you couldn't move at all in, a, in an unstable hip, so you're unstable and you're acute, the risk of avascular necrosis is nearly 50%, 47% in his paper. If you can weight bear on it, in one way or the other, if you can get up and walk around, 
then the risk is zero. And any time you get AVN in those hips, you've caused it by doing an operation on it. And that's the problem. That's, that's what we've used to decide what to do in slip epiphysis to date. But people get confused about the stability business. And there are papers that will say, oh, instability includes, um, sorry, stability includes walking around with crutches or not walking around with crutches. Actually, you can't move your hip at all if you're unstable. And that's the definition. So he very, very recently, and this is two months ago, published in JPO, Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics. This is Randall, Randy Loder who described the classification and looked at the entire literature of unstable slipped epiphyses and looked at what the rate of avascular necrosis was, which is the thing we fear most. And overall in the literature of all the papers ever published, the rate is 21%. So even though in his series it was 47%, the rate in the literature is half of that, 21%. And having looked at all the studies, he said the literature points towards 